welcome to the Dial Global Virtual Lounge. This is the show where we discuss the future of the modern workplace and the impact of diversity, inclusion, and belonging with the world's most successful and innovative leaders. Today, we've got a fantastic panel of guests with us. Uh, we have Jeff McDonald, who is the former CHRO of Unilever and also mental health campaigner and co-founder of, of Minds at Work. We have Mira Machega, who is the chief people officer and a huge advocate of diversity, and inclusion and belonging at, at Just Each. She's had a wealth of international experience across the board. And we also have Liz Silverstone. Now, Liz is actually my, my personal counsellor and is one of the most amazing people ever because she manages to cope with me. But aside of that, she has two decades worth of experience when it comes to counselling and mental health. She is a occupational therapist and is very well versed when it comes to not only counselling, counselling of, of youth, couples counselling, but, uh, but knows all about mental health and, uh, and well-being. So, uh, so fantastic to have you all here today. Uh, it's a really diverse mind, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So before we kickstart and kind of get into the bones of what we're discussing today, which is all around mental health, well-being, how we are all managing to cope and lead our people in times of uncertainty. Jeff, I'm going to come and pick on you first because I love to pick on you. Tell us, what are you kind of up to at the moment and how have you been personally impacted? And maybe we can all go a quick round robin and, and intro what we are doing at the minute and a bit about us. Oh, cool. Thanks, Leila. And uh, thank you so much for having me today. And um, thanks for elevating what I was, because I wasn't the chief HR officer of Unilever, but I was, you know, the global head of HR for all of our marketing, communications and sustainability around the Unilever world. But, um, you know, how's, how's this impacted me? Uh, it's impacted me in many ways. You know, a lot of what I do is, is speaking to audiences, engaging with executives and boards, mainly doing events, motivational speaking around the subject of mental health and well-being. And all those events have, have dried up. They've all dried up and they've been postponed. And so now I've, I've had to pivot what I've been doing. Um, and I've pivoted that into a number of webinars uh, for companies and for their employees uh, around you know, just talking about the psychological effects of COVID-19. Um, what is it that you could be doing to look after your mental and your, your emotional health at this time? Some guidelines around working from home. And then what should leaders be doing? How should leaders be leading? Um, and so those webinars have been keeping me uh, very, very busy. I mean, it's just, it's been fantastic because again, you know, it's, it's a different way for me to kind of live out my sense of purpose, which is to create these workplaces all over the world where people feel they genuinely have the choice to just put their hand up and ask for some help if they're suffering from a common form of mental ill health. Because we can do that with our physical health, but why can't we do it when we are not feeling mentally healthy? And, um, and the other thing which has been fantastic is, is I'm getting fitter and fitter every day. So it's either a walk or a run or a cycle. The only thing I can't do is swim, which is a real pain because I love my swimming. Mm -hmm. You could always try it in the bath. <laughs> Yeah, you know what, Liz? I, 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 I don't know when I last had a bath, so um, <laughs> I don't know what a bath looks like. So you could pretend to in the shower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got these, I, I, when I do my running, I run with poles, and so I, I run with, and, I, and I use the poles in my running, which is hopefully keeping the the, the top part of my body um, relatively fit. <laughs> oh my goodness! I've never seen anyone ever running with poles before. <laughs> they're amazing Never. they're so cool running poles they are so cool uh they light and but you but they're on but i but they for trail running i do trail mm. running i don't run on the on the road mira so thank you for inviting me onto the chat today covid has been an interesting it it came a bit out of the blue obviously um and then trying to wrap what we're doing as an organization around it has been an interesting journey and just getting our people ready has been the biggest impact in terms of COVID. How do we go from being in the office virtually every day to working across the world 
but in a virtual setting. So we had previously been doing work and experimenting around smart working, which is our, our take on flexibility. Um, and we launched it earlier in this year, earlier this year after doing some pilots. And the big thing was actually, we don't really have a choice here. The world of work has gone virtual. So what does that mean? How do we very quickly get our staff ready for it? But how do we get our managers ready to manage virtual teams? So that's been interesting. At the same time, we've been dealing with potential positive cases of COVID, um, family members getting COVID and, and providing that support mechanism as well. So it's been a quick setup of how we manage and also how we then keep our people informed, how we make some real conscious decisions on how we're going to run the business um, whilst also supporting our people internally, but also looking at our stakeholders. So as an industry, food delivery is still one of the ones that can continue. And so how do we support our partners um, during this phase of pandemic as well? So it's, it's been dual, triple um, focused in terms of how we help. A bit like Jeff, I will be fitter by the time we're, out, we're allowed out because um, I am exercising pretty much five days a week i um, taking a couple of days off and it is fantastic. So I hope to look better, but also feel much better in terms of mental health and physical health by the end of this, because we have time where we're not commuting, which is awesome. Wonderful. And from the people perspective, oh my goodness, it just must be so incredibly busy, you know, huge amount of communication going on, which is required, uh, yeah. of course, at, at times like this. Absolutely. We've been communicating with our people um, twice a day specifically about COVID and any updates. We're now moving to more of a daily cadence. So, yep, absolutely. And Liz? <laughs> Hi. Okay, so I kind of started out working in psychiatry as a senior psychiatric occupational therapist. I did that for several years. I worked at Guy's, I worked at Bart's, I worked in a mental health resource centre. Then I took a, quite a long time out, a, a break, uh, when I ran a successful contemporary art and craft gallery. And then in about 2002, I decided to go back to my counselling roots, trained at Relate, did a postgrad diploma. However, these days, um, I work closely with a psychiatrist. I've gone back to kind of my mental health roots. So I do less couples. I work with young people over 16, most of whom are around kind of self-harm, kind of difficulties, um, uh, university, those kind of things. So a lot of my work these days is, is with mental health. And I suppose for me, this has been a totally new situation because I've only ever done face-to-face counselling. I've only ever wanted to do face-to-face counselling. And I guess I've been put in a position where for my clients, I've had to use other, other ways of of kind of having sessions with them. So Skype, Zoom, um, FaceTime, phone um, has been an interesting experience, but kind of easier than I thought it might be. A lot of my clients, my existing clients, I think are struggling with the issues around coronavirus rather than what they originally came to see me about. So a lot of the work is kind of around how that has impacted them. So, you know, we're not necessarily talking about what they came to see me about, but kind of, you know, with the couples, it's um, being together in, you know, together when maybe the relationship mm. is great with individuals. It's, you know, I work with clients who self-employed, um, have no income, people whose businesses have gone to the wall um, because of COVID and, and dealing with all the kind of psychological psychological in impact of that um, on them and their lives. Personally, for me, um, unfortunately, I have an underlying health condition. So I got the old NHS letter, which says a minimum of three months um, lockdown for me. Um, so I um, can't go out at all now. So I'm missing walking my dog. I'm having to get somebody else to work my dog. So I envy all of you kind of going out and getting fit because sadly I'm not able to do that. Um, well, I can run up. You can do it in the well, home. Well, I can run. Yeah, I can yeah. run up and down the stairs. 
And you can do it in the um, bar, like you said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should do as I say, shouldn't I, as a counselor? <laughs> yeah, I should be doing a few lengths of the bath every day. <laughs> Yoga is great, Liz. There is a brilliant app called Down Dog, and it is so fantastic. I've heard about lots of teams doing group yoga and doing, well, group oh, coaching no, sessions, not which is not less yoga, healthy. Yoga or Pilates, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are other things, other things. Yes, yes. Anyway, thanks so much for sharing, Liz. And you now I'm very, very lucky that I know a lot about your, your, your background and, and kind of some of the work you do. And, you know, we'll be very interesting, I think, to get, as we get further into the, the chat and the conversations for today, how, how we can, you know, perhaps glean some nuggets of wisdom from all of you, in fact, about those who are in work and, and who are struggling. So I know that, Liz, you've got a lot of, you know, you've had a lot of corporate uh, clients and people coming to you with, with, with stress and what have you from work you know clearly that has changed quite quite significantly now and it's uh you know we're, we're almost looking at this with, with, with a broader broader brush almost but hints tips advice guidance as to to what we can possibly do in these uh, these uncertain times which mm -hmm. i think is I mean, confidence from our leaders is critical. And I think it is very difficult to a degree. Clearly, you know, the government can't you know, see what is potentially happening next. And so we're looking almost more so to our leaders now to give us the faith and give us the reassurance and that arm around the shoulder that tells us it's OK. We're kind of in this together, really. But yes, I, I mean, I guess I, I wondered your thoughts around how important it is for leaders and, and what we perhaps should be, should be doing. Is there such a thing as over communicating in times like this? Perhaps not. Yeah. Look, I mean, I mean, you know, if I were to just summarize at a very high level what I think leaders uh, should be doing right now, um, I think the first thing that they should be doing is they should be instilling a sense of stability and trying to help manage the uncertainty as best they can. So in their communications, in their engagement with their people, are they coming across as a leader who is instilling a degree of stability and trying to reduce the uncertainty as much as they can? I think the other thing that they should be doing at this moment in time is they should be instill, instilling a huge sense of trust that people actually trust them and what is being said, people can believe. But I also think that they should be trusting their people and empowering their people. I really don't think that this is a time for micromanagement and making sure that people are working like they normally work and, you know, having meetings and checking in on people and what's happening. I mean, people's lives are so disrupted working from home. So just empower and trust your people. So I think instilling trust is the second. The third is I think they should be instilling a high degree of compassion. The workplace needs compassion. And in some ways, COVID-19 is helping us to create more human workplaces right now. And it's mm -hmm. wonderful to see how some organizations are taking this on. Yes, business continuity is important, but you know, creating a more human, loving workplace, I think is absolutely critical. And the fourth thing that I would, I would say that they, you know, that they need to instill is they need to instill a kind of a sense of um, what I would call a, a, a positive attitude as, as much as they can. So stability, reduce uncertainty, instill trust in your people, instill uh, compassion, and, 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 and instill that kind of positive attitude as best you can. And, and that's so true, Jeff, because that's exactly what we've been trying to do. So we've got a cadence of comms that goes out so i mentioned right at the beginning that we've got daily we had twice a day covid specific um, announcements and updates going out in a single place we've created wellness hubs we've got a weekly pulse survey going out around how are people finding working from home what are some of their challenges it literally takes three minutes to complete so that we can keep our pulse on it um, we, we right from the beginning we did some work around flexibility so kind of saying look, we know this is going to be difficult because schools are closing. So anyone who is working with children at home, actually, it's going to be difficult. So we've kind of gone, it's up to you to do yeah, wonderful work. It's up to you to talk to your manager and go, it's difficult for me to work between the hours of 12 and three. So actually, I'm going to flex my day and work in the morning, 
my partner, my wife, husband, whatever is going to work in the afternoon and we're going to flip and then we're going to come back in the evening. We're going to get our work done, but it's having that open dialogue of conversation. We're also concentrating sufficiently on mental health and also physical health. So are people taking the right breaks away from their screen? Are they able to feel that connectivity? And actually they're all the important things and they're all in our pulse survey. So we can see when it's going up, when it's going down and then putting in measures and taking action on what we do with that. So we're absolutely doing that. But the big thing is trust and open comms. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I think the I mean, other, I'm... you know, sorry, Liz, sorry. Just, and then I'll shut up. I mean, the other, the other bit, you know, for me, the positive attitude is just instilling that sense of hope. You know, when, when I was really, really ill with anxiety, fuel, depression back in 2008 and being able to talk about my illness and speak to people who had been ill and saw they were better, you know, you know how powerful that sense of hope was in my recovery. And I think, you know, I think it's important that that positive attitude helps to instill the sense of hope for people. You know, some of these webinars I've been doing, I mean, it, it, it's all about just that reassuring voice at the end of, you know, the phone or, you know, it's that, just that, that small bit of reassurance that people are looking for. Sorry, Liz. No, not at all. I mean, I think certainly as a mental, you know, as a mental health worker, I think that, you know, the, the, the I think the importance of for people to know um where they can actually get help um you know is really important i think it's really important for for kind of businesses to be signposting people you know their employees um as to where they can where they can actually get help if they struggling if they've got anxieties if they've got depression if they're feeling overwhelmed if they want to talk to somebody where do they find that person to talk to you know i think you know certainly in these times i th i think i think you know my take is that for people who have already got mental health problems they're going to be exacerbated at this time and I think that there will be a lot of people who really didn't have mental health problems who are going to be having mental health problems. And I think that certainly when all this is over, I think certainly in terms of not just frontline medical staff, I think that counselling for trauma and for post-traumatic stress is going to be huge. You know, I think I think that, you know, and I don't think that we're going to be prepared for it. I don't think we're going to be prepared for the numbers of people who are actually going to need that. And that's kind of what worries me um, on a on a personal level. I have clients that I, I'm checking in with every couple of days. Um, I'm offering free counselling to frontline um, NHS workers and those in the caring profession um, because I think that's really important um, with with the fact that you know a lot of people are being furloughed a lot of people's businesses have gone to the wall a lot of people self-employed have not got any income important for me ethically to offer free counseling to them um, you know and I think certainly for those in business they really, you know, they think it's really important for them to be signposting their, you know, their workers, their employees. Um, however, whether it's employee assistance work, you know, some companies have employee assistance programs. You know, I've gone on to a list at the hospital in Coventry as a counsellor. You know, there are, I, I think, almost to provide them with some kind of list of services that are out there yeah. that, that, that they can access I think is hugely important and agree Liz one of the things that we've tried to do is ensure that people know where to get access to this information yeah. so and it's in a single point and we're offering and we have been um, we launched the unmind app for example earlier this year or last, yeah. year, last year in fact globally to all our staff um, we've got Sanctus sessions, which again used to be face to face, and we flipped them to virtual sessions. We've got EAP providers in some countries. We've got some 
um, private medical care, all of that stuff is in a single point so that people need is brilliant. To go to get the support because the worst thing is you know that you've got this support available and then you have no idea how to access it. It then yeah. and you might have already lost the moment that someone was going to make that phone yeah. call. Mm -hmm. that and so mm -hmm. we're desperately trying to ensure that people know and direct people into a single point. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I kind of, my, my sense is that there is not enough of that going on. I mean, I think, you know, I think, you know, certainly at the end of all this, I think, you know, uh, councillors are going to be absolutely overloaded with work because I think a lot of the stresses, being overwhelmed, the traumas, the PST is happening afterwards. Um, you know, at the moment, people are you know, like the frontline workers, they're, they're, they're getting through every day the best that they can get through. And counselling maybe isn't at the, the foremost of their minds. Um, you know, they've just got to go in there and, and, you know, try and help people the best way that they can do. Um, but I hope that enough bigger companies, corporate companies, will recognise the need for their employees to have access for mental health and um, support. Some really, really fascinating insight there. And, you know, I think Mira, it, you're, you're absolutely brilliant at spearheading and driving things like this forward. And the fact that you have really championed make sh making sure that mental health is at the top of the agenda before all of this, is brilliant hence why it's fantastic having you here on the panel because like liz says there are not necessarily enough businesses who are putting health and well-being at the top of the agenda there aren't necessarily businesses I, well actually there's a lot who are starting to signpost when it comes to uh, to to covid and having covid hubs like we have a covid hub and again we're, we're offering that completely free because i think it's not right ethically to not do things like this to support the wider community at present. But it is critical that this hopefully remains on the agenda afterwards. And, you know, another point that I particularly wanted to talk about, which Jeff, you, you touched upon there, was you going through your own mental health battle and how that changed the way you looked at things. And most importantly of all, the fact that you spoke out about it because I think there is still unfortunately a very big taboo as a bit of an umbrella when it comes to mental health and especially leaders who are in senior positions who are at the levels um, that you are at in organizations like the level that you're at Mira you know there is still a taboo mm. about talking out about not feeling great not feeling great and not not feeling well and especially for the CEOs and the C-suite especially guys and Jeff I've said this to you before you know as a guy men without being too general in uh, in what I'm saying here but men specifically who come from maybe the slightly archetypal leadership background don't feel necessarily that comfortable to talk about this so hopefully COVID might actually push the agenda on that side but mm. it's just so important to talk about it so people think, well, it's okay. Because it's like what you said, if it's a difference between picking up the phone and not picking up the phone, what can we do to nudge people yeah. into the picking up the phone side of things? Jeff, any thoughts around sharing personal stories? Because I, and, and what, what from, from the mental health charity that, that, that you run and you co-found, what have your experiences been? Because there are businesses who are doing great things about this and there's some who perhaps still are, are, are a little tepid when it comes to wanting to share stories. Yeah, you know, uh, Leila, I mean, when I um, co led you know, I mean, my story was 2008, I get really ill. Uh, the only thing that keeps me alive is my ability to talk, not to be burdened by the stigma of anxiety fueled depression, which I was suffering with. Uh, 2012, my, my best friend, or one of my best friends, dies by suicide. He's an alpha male Afrikaner South African. There's no ways he can talk about how he was feeling. I lie in bed that night and I think to myself, the only difference between him and I was my ability to talk and his inability to talk. And stigma had just killed my friend. Now, that was the catalyst for me to go out into the world and to try and address the stigma of mental mm -hmm. ill health um, in, in workplaces. And, and I can tell you, a kindergarten is a workplace. You know, yes, EAT is a workplace. Yes, HSBC is a workplace. And so I, I co-led a piece of work in Unilever for 18 months around addressing stigma. And the most powerful lever 
in beginning to normalize the breaking of the stigma was when we had senior, influential people, and not only senior, influential. So a shift manager on a factory floor sharing and telling their stories. It was the most single powerful lever in beginning to normalize mental ill health in the organization. So personal stories for me, um, you know, and, and at the time, this is back in 2012, you know, I was so frustrated. I was listening to, I was listening to, yes, of course, I'm, you know, and I should be grateful, but you know, you've got the politicians, they were t- talking about it and sharing their stories and you had sports people doing it, you know, and then you had Prince Harry starting to talk about it, but there was nobody from the workplace. There were no senior business leaders sharing their stories. And don't tell me that they're none of them, none of them have ever suffered from a mental ill health condition. And I, and I just think that personal stories and sharing those stories across the organization is the single most powerful leader. And, 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 you know, it can't just be what you're finding now is young people in organizations today are more open about this stuff. And, but it's not good enough that it's just the young junior managers doing this. We, we need influential senior. I mean, nobody ever would have thought that I would suffer from anxiety, fuel, depression. I mean, when I shared my story, people, what, really? But you know what? I'm just a human being. And yeah. there was nothing wrong with me at the time. Something just happened to me. And I'm not strong. I'm not weak. I'm just a human being. Mm. Yeah, and I think, I, you know, I suppose I find it quite a shame that, you know, when I, when I trained and worked as an occupational therapist in psychiatry, we're, we're going back about 30 years um, and the stigma was huge then of, of mental health. And, you know, and I suppose I always thought kind of, you know, years on now, having gone back to working with people with mental health problems, the stigma would be a lot less. Um, but, but I find it, it, it kind of saddens me that it's still there. Um, okay, it's not maybe as bad as it was then but it is still there you know there's still this kind of um uh you know people struggling to think about taking any kind of medication you know i kind of say well look you know if you had a heart condition um you know if you had um, a broken leg if you had something like that you know, you would go to your GP and you would be put on some medication and you wouldn't think twice about it. Um, but people are very kind of uh, reluctant um, when it comes to any kind of medication for psychological problems. Um, you know, and it's, and I'm not saying it's for everybody, but for some people, it's a lifeline. For some people, it saves their lives. Um, taking medication Um, and certainly I you know I only suggest to clients to go and see their GP when I can see that they are really struggling with mental health and and my sense is that um, for their recovery process they need to be on some medication but you know there is still this huge reluctance but the, the one thing that I would like to say is that in terms of the number of clients coming to see me who are male clients, it has increased dramatically, which I think is brilliant. I have more and more male clients coming to see me and more and more male kind of corporate clients coming to see me. Um, And I just think that is, you know, that's over the last probably five, six years, um, which is, you know, which is brilliant. Um, Because when I first started out, I hardly had any male clients and it's increased and it's increased and it's increased, which is great, which is great, you know, that that men are now kind of feeling, well, actually, um, I could go and see somebody and talk about what's going on for me. And that's, you know, so important. So wonderful to hear, Liz. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly kind of been one of the you know one of the really the more positive things that I found in my job in the last few years um is the increase in in male clients yeah so it's 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 good it's good um and I think people like yourselves telling their story sharing their narrative at all levels 
is hugely important. You know, I think then people can kind of maybe identify. And then when they have identified with somebody who has shared their story, they can then think, well, actually, maybe um, going to see somebody and getting some help would be a good thing to do. Um, And if this leader, you know, if this really big person who's kind of up here somewhere has gone and done that, then I can go and do that. Yeah. I think that's really great to hear, Liz. And I think just very quickly, flitting back to your previous mention there of uh, of medication, because I think there's a big taboo against taking medication yes. as well. I think um, there are, I mean, I've talked to people about this, and since we are sharing openly here, I have been taking antidepressants and anti-anxiety tablets for many, many, many years, for a decade, I think now, on and off. And Honestly, if someone had said before that, take antidepressants, I would have thought that they were, they were mad or like many people still think, oh, they make you high or something like that. They absolutely don't. But if you are in the mind state or as Jeff, you, you've described there, you know, having a, a close friend commit suicide, just terrible. You never know what's going on in people's lives or, or how your mind can suddenly be affected by whatever it might be that happens in the ether. And it is just those antidepressants that can help scoop you out of the pit of the hole and help you then be able to help yourself. And I think it's very difficult to understand that state of mind to a degree unless you have experienced it or if you, unless you have, uh, I guess, seen someone who has, who has been through that but it is partially the chemical imbalance in the brain so to 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 use points that you've all referred to there it's it's like breaking a leg no one would say you shouldn't have a plastic cast on it it's there to support the healing of that regrowth almost and sorry Leila, but i would like to say that the evidence is that medication in conjunction with talking therapy has a better outcome than medication on its own you know I don't you know I, th- I think that there is in a way so, you know but for for some GPs too much chucking medication at clients without again signposting them to um, ca- to counseling services like I apt to um, counselors like myself and you know it's I think it, it that is really important to have the combination of the two of those things absolutely absolutely and um mira a- any thoughts before my my next question which i think actually leads on quite nicely is how can we spot the signs of people that we're working with or even people in our personal lives because let's face it the lines now are starting to get blurred and so mental health does exist everywhere you know it can exist all, all, all around us how can we start to spot signs so we can then put positive steps in place I think that's probably one of our biggest challenges as being a corporate because you want to be supportive you want to be open and you don't want to make assumptions and so the work that we've been doing around um, mental health first aiders for example and getting some of our managers and senior managers trained on that is kind of helpful but that doesn't that also means you don't go around making assumptions or presumptions on people's health and actually having two way dialogue and creating a culture of openness is probably the key within the workplace to help people through that so when jeff and liz were talking about open cultures and having those dynamic leaders or any leaders or anyone in the organization who talk openly about mental health that's what we've been on a journey to we know we're nowhere near perfect and we we still have work to do but actually us getting some real pivotal people sharing their own personal story standing up openly and going i am getting counseling i am getting therapy is really starting to open the door we are finding that the more junior talent coming in have an expectation of being able to have these conversations so them seeing when they're being onboarded them seeing our kitchen articles um, which is our intranet um and being able to refer back to stories and our support and our wellness hub actually help that conversation. But there's a lot more that can still be done. 
I think it's really great that you shared some of the pieces there. And I love, I would love after, after this, people who are, who are tuning in or organizations to start taking a lead. I love how you say, look, we're not perfect as well. I think it's so important that corporate organizations that we all you know, look up to and we, we hear about the household names, you know, obviously you want to hear they're doing good things and know you're doing some fantastic things at Just Eat, but the acceptance that none of us are perfect corporates aren't perfect and a long journey to go on we we started 12 months ago i think it'd be impossible to say we've done everything and we've we've nailed it because i don't think you ever do nail it even when you think you've got a solid view of life and you've got a solid process or you've got solid ways of reaching out actually there's iterations there's learning and it's that continuous process and we're nowhere near done but i think i think in many ways um you know I think the starting point, the starting point in this conversation around healthy employees absolutely starts with the mental health conversation and, and addressing the stigma. Because I have, a, I have a vision and it's a narrative that I have been peddling now for the last 18 months. And in a very bizarre way, COVID-19 is proving me right. But a lot of our conversation right now has been about the kind of almost the reactive piece, waiting for somebody, spotting the signs, signposting them. But mm -hmm. I want to see organizations actually seeing the health of their people as a performance driver. Mm -hmm. I want to see organizations actually starting to think about, you know what, the most important driver of the performance of my people is their energy. When they've got no energy, when they are not healthy, they can't perform. COVID-19, is proving that so yeah. why don't we why aren't we beginning to see health as a strategic priority and we begin to create workplaces where guess what by going to work we're going to enhance your life I mean it's quite incredible that every single organization that I go into invest billions in keeping people safe at work why wouldn't they want to also keep them emotionally and mentally healthy at work why are we only concerned about their physical safety? Do we kind of think that they leave their emotions and their cognitive abilities at the door when they walk in? And so I think there's a huge opportunity. And Mira, I think the starting point for all of this is because I would love in the performance development conversation is that I have a development conversation with my people about their energy, about their health. And, and I want to be able to have that open conversation, but I will never be able to have it about the, all aspects of their health if there's still a huge stigma. And yeah. so I think you're absolutely right in terms of where you're starting. But I think the end point is this kind of, you know what? The health of our people is a strategic priority and we are going to invest in it like we do any other strategic priority and we will execute it like we execute other strategic priorities, which in many ways is a change program, which requires a huge amount of change of behavior in the organization. I mean, right now we have well-being weeks and then we, you know, the other 52 <laughs> weeks of the year just flog people to death. It's like me saying, oh, we're going to put a new IT system in place like called SAP because we think it's going to drive efficiency in the business. It's a strategic priority. But we put it in for one week and then we go back to the old. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, yeah. but, but I think the starting point is absolutely where, where Mira and Eat are, is about, is about being able to have the mental and emotional ill health conversation. And then we can talk bigger uh, around how health becomes a performance driver. And actually, what, you, what you've just highlighted is really important because we've got five questions that we go out with on a weekly pulse survey. And two of them are around physical health and the other one's around mental health. And so we could be doing absolutely more in terms of the work around wellness, and we call it wellness, but actually it, it's there we just could do more yeah. and i think any everyone could do more yeah but i think everybody could could do more and i kind of think that you know that it it's it's got to come from the from the top 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 um in that you know mental health generally mental health has always been the bottom of the pile um you know psychiatry has always been the bottom of the pile yeah um, and I think it, you know, I think it's great that the kind of royals, for example, are starting now to talk about mental health because it's kind of starting at, you know, that level, a really high level, 
you know and i think that you know it's it's being more talked about rather than kind of being being hidden away you know you kind of mental health is in a box somewhere and and we deal with people's physical health and and physical health has always been kind of priority you know i i hope um that as the years go on that mental health will become more and more and more of a priority in all aspects of people's lives and in all aspects of business because it is so fundamental yeah. to to the workplace um to the employees and i think as as you say we worry you know jeff we worry about their their safety and their performance but yeah what about their mental health in all of this mm. yeah so it's but yeah i think, I mean, I think I'm, but I, I like the i like the framing I like the framing that Mira talks around in terms of wellness, because I think, I think that if, if you just, because for me, wellness is about your physical health. It's about your emotional health. It's about your mental health and it's about your spiritual health. Now, now I don't like to use the word spiritual health, but I like to use the term purpose and meaning, you know, has the organization created a sense of purpose and meaning for people beyond growth and profitability? And so, and I, and, and, and for me, it's then, and even wellness, I mean, I, I'm more and more using this term energy. I mean, you know, how, how many organizations do you go into and people are saying, oh, we want energized, enthusiastic people in our organization. Yet we, and the way you get your energy is by being healthy, physically healthy, emotionally healthy, mentally healthy, and having that sense of purpose and meaning. Yet we never ever have a conversation with anybody about the most important driver of their performance, their energy. And mental health is a critical component of that. But I do, I do sometimes, you know, you, you, you're right, Liz. I mean, you know, my, you, in the past, my entry point was very much the mental health thing. But I'm thinking more, it's a bit more of a holistic entry point because people are a little bit scared of the mental health mental word. Mental health word, yes. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah. I, I, I often say that the most damaged brand in the world is mental health. It's the most damaged brand. When I talk about physical health, I don't immediately go to cancer, diabetes, glandular fever. When I say the word mental health, people immediately go to depression, they go to anxiety. Do you know what? Mental health is fantastic. When I'm mentally healthy, it is amazing. Yeah. Now, yeah. mental ill health is not, good, is not good, but it's such a damaged brand. And I think we've got to find a way of, you know, when you walk into a Nike store or an Adidas store, you see chiseled whippets all over the walls. They look beautiful, these images of these people. They chiseled whippets. And I walk in with my overweight body and I kind of see that picture and I feel inspired and I go and buy a pair of running shoes. When it comes to mental health, what are the images you see? People in a psychiatric asylum, there is a black and white photograph, they've got a white coat on. I mean, what's inspirational and aspirational about encouraging people to have good mental health? Yeah, and, no, and, I, would, I would agree with you thoroughly. You know, and so I, I think it's, there is that, it's the language, the entry point, how it fits in the culture of an eat, for example. Uh, and, and I think, but you're so right about, about the mental health piece. You can't talk about wellness without talking about people's mental and emotional health. You can't. Yeah, yeah. Completely agree with everything that you've all said there, and that that piece of uh, that 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 analogy that you gave there as well, Jeff, which is why I think it's particularly good that mirror what you're doing and and what Just Eat are doing is calling it wellness because it frames it in a far more positive way, and it also mm -hmm. makes this far more holistic. It's the same with diversity and inclusion and getting people to understand it's about so much more. You still speak to a lot of people who say, "Oh, diversity and inclusion, well, that's HR or that doesn't involve me." It's like, hello. No, it is a board-wide issue and it affects everyone. Diversity, inclusion, belonging affects everyone. Wellness, as you said there, it affects everyone. And I think giving it that broad piece, then chunking it down into other portions um, yeah. and driving home the importance of mental health is, is absolutely key. Um, and just to quickly moving, moving on, guys, because I, uh, I know you have... Uh, have things to go to. I can't believe it's it's two o'clock already. Mira, before you um, pop off um, today's call, uh, I just had one very, very, very quick 
question for you from, uh, we had quite a few questions from our, our listeners, but I'm gonna send one your way very quickly, if that's okay, and um, before I come to the other two, and then we will, we'll, we'll do a summary once, once, you've, once you've popped off. But the question was, how has the values of Just Eat uh, helped guide your decision-making during the crisis? So actually, it's really funny, because I was on a talk yesterday, and our values are great, And I don't mean that because we created them, but they are actually, they're abbreviated to great. So get it done, razor sharp, evolution at pace, ambitious appetite, and together we win. And one of the things that as the COVID pandemic started was we wanted the way that we communicate, the way that we approach the COVID challenge internally to be underpinned by our values. And the biggest one in terms of internally but also externally with our stakeholders is together we win. So how do we support our colleagues who are going through challenging times, be that because they have family care whilst trying to work, be that our restaurant partners who under normal circumstances would potentially have um, customers coming in and how do we support that whole network of people, including couriers. So we've been working on that premise of, our values underpin everything that we do and they continue even while we're working at home. Mm. Thank you so much, Mira. That is, do you know what? It's been brilliant seeing a window into the world of some of the things you're doing. The fact you've been really honest and said, uh, you know, actually, you know, you're not perfect. I actually think that there's a huge amount that, that you and the team are doing at Just Eat that others can, can really learn from um, and make sure that actually this is a priority and it is continued long after coronavirus so for those who are putting it in now keep it going you've obviously put it in quite some time ago which is fantastic but I know that you have to uh, to pop off for today so I will um, continue very briefly because we have some other questions and um, what I will do as well as I'll put in some summary notes at the end so people can get in touch with us if they have more questions for you absolutely and thank you and apologies I have to run Lovely no worries, me. no worries at Good all it is, it is the world we're living in right now and I Take think you're doing Mary. a fantastic job Thank you. Fantastic job. Thank you, Mira. Jeff, a question for you, which to a a degree actually you did, uh, you have covered a a huge amount during uh, during the the panel uh, today. Uh, But the question was, health and energized employees enhances business performance. So why are businesses not putting health and well-being as a strategic priority? We've had a couple that are similar yeah, to that. I, look, look I, think, I think the first thing is, you know, I mean, people like Liz and I, we live in this world. We live in this world of health, mental health. Uh, it's very obvious to us that health has a direct relationship to performance. I'm not sure senior people actually have made that connection. Mm. You know, I, I don't think, I, I think it's very, very, I think it's very, very dangerous for us to make the assumption that they really, really see the connection between energy, health, and performance. Yeah. And, and for that reason, so, so, so I, I don't think we must make that assumption. And I think we've got to find ways to bring that con- conversation uh, to the boardroom to the yeah. executive team. And, and look, it's a little bit like the diversity and inclusion agenda, Leila. I mean, for years we've known that, and there are all oh, sorts of it. spaces have been written about having a more diverse and inclusive uh, organization will lead to better performance. We've all known that. And particularly on the gender side, we've known it, yet we've made not the kind of progress that one would have expected with all these business cases. And so I think that there's a second element, which is about the will to do it. Yeah, I think it's looking at the resistance. Exactly. It's about the will to do this. Why do we need a business case to make people healthy at work? Why is it not just the right thing to do as an organization, irrespective of whether there's a business case or there isn't a business case? And I think we need more and more. I just hope COVID-19 is proving unhealthy people all over the world, the economies come to a standstill. And you know what? It's just the right thing to do to ensure that you invest in the health of your people. 
Yeah. Absolutely. And it's costing the UK and worldwide oh. businesses a fortune as well. So yeah. Yeah. very briefly on the business case, it is costing a ridiculous amount of money. So even if you don't care about it, well, care about the bottom line of the business because it is costing a ridiculous amount of time off when it comes to people going off on but sick I, leave and not coping. But I think there's one other point that I would make. The third thing is you cannot care about the health of your people if you don't care about your own health. Mm. And how yeah. many senior people out there do not act, are not healthy, are not looking after their health, you know, are struggling, are working 24 seven, are using all sorts of other things to keep themselves going. And you, you know, we can't, you can't care for other people's health if we can't care for our own health. You can't, yeah. you can't care for somebody else if you aren't prepared to self-care. Um, and, 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 you know, again, I think COVID-19 will, will, will help in this agenda. Um, and so that's one of the positives that I see coming out of COVID-19. And I'm 100% with Liz. I know that there's significant trauma. I've just seen some data out of China today uh, around depression, post-traumatic stress, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And Huge. It's scary. It is scary. Yeah. But yeah, so the will to do this, look after your own health, and then you'll start caring about the, the health of other people. And yes, making this stronger connection between energy, health, and performance. Like the aeroplane analogy, put your gas mask yeah. on, your oxygen mask rather, on before you put anyone else's on. Because if you can't breathe, you can't yeah. help anyone else when yeah. it comes to their breathing. And finally, for a question for, for you, Liz, before I do a very quick summary and wrap up, I should yeah. have known with you, you, you lovely lot, that we'd end up going far over. In fact, we could probably end up talking here for another hour quite easily, <laughs> um, but <laughs> in the nicest possible way. I love you all. Um, a, so question, Liz, for, for you, or two very quick questions, actually, was, um, is there a, what, what, what's the age spread when it comes to male counseling of course uh, given you're seeing a increase and um, uh, sorry other quick question whilst you're thinking of that one is someone or people struggling to talk to their bosses about needing support on the mental health side through fear that it might impact promotions yeah any thoughts yeah i mean i think in terms of the spread of male clients it's actually across the board now that I'm I'm seeing from from younger people to people in their 50s, 60s. So it's a fairly widespread. And I think that, you know, there is the fear that, um, you know, if, if people kind of contact human resources at work or occupational health or anything like that, um, that they're going to get some kind of black mark against them um, for, for kind of seeking any kind of support um, with their, I'll, I'll use the term well-being. Um, and um, it's, it's a, it, I think that that's a really difficult one. Um, and I think, I think that it's only through uh, time and people being more kind of open and transparent and out there talking about their well-being talking about their their mental health their physical health is it actually going to become easier for um for, for people to actually um seek that help without that fear that if they do seek it that's going to affect my chances of promotion in this company that this company isn't going to see that as a huge black mark against that person. Um, and I think it's, it's changing slowly, um, but it's kind of not happening quickly enough, I don't think. And maybe with this current situation that we're in, that will change. I hope it will change. I really hope it will change. Um, I hope more people will actually be able to um, go and talk to their their managers um, and and seek seek help in one in 
in one way or another uh, without worrying about how it's going to affect their, 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 as you say, their promotion chances. Thank you so much, Liz. And thank you all ever so much. Obviously, fantastic to have Mira here as well, who has now had to go. But I've been making prolific notes, actually, as per usual, uh, during, the, uh, during the course of this, uh, this virtual lounge. And there have been so many fantastic learning points and so many great perspectives from all of you in your various respective roles. And I know that there will be a number of people out there who are uh, listening in on demand uh, to this, thinking, do you know what, actually, it's okay to, to be able to share and it's okay to be able to tell my story or to seek help. And so by way of a very, very brief summary, um, I, I, I would say some of the key points that really stood out for me were the fact that the stigma is unfortunately still there. If you are not as an organization or as an individual doing anything about it, or you've noticed there's not enough talk about it within your organization, say something, please. It is only by listening and speaking out that we can actually really address this issue and move the dial. Make sure you bring this in front of your seasoned leaders and those who are at the top, because it is only by addressing this at the top that can we allow this to filter through down the pyramid. So we need more Jeffs in corporate world. We need more mirrors in corporate worlds who are willing to share their story. In specific to all of the guys out there, and to everyone else as well. But if you are a guy who is, you know, from the older generation um, and it's not necessarily socially accepted to talk about this, please say something. Because if not for you, then for other people who look up to you as a leader and may be suffering. But don't be worried about bringing this to the forefront. Don't be worried about going to HR. There are some great HR professionals out there who are very understanding. This should no longer be a taboo subject. We must keep speaking out, we must listen, we must make sure we signpost our staff to all of the various resources and make sure that we are really putting this at the top of the agenda, not only when COVID-19 is over, but forever. This is something yeah. that will always be there. And like D and I and B and the fact that mental health and well-being falls into that agenda as well, it's something that it's living and breathing and sleeping and so we can't tick the box and say hey we've done it for a week you've got to keep it on the agenda all the time so thank you very very much indeed on the point of signposting i'm going to put all of the details from today's dial global virtual lounge at the end of this show onto our website you'll be able to reach out to jeff mira and also liz they are all very busy, so bear with them at this time. Um, but you can feel free to send us any questions. If you've been affected by anything today, please don't be a stranger. Get in touch. Myself, any of the team, very, very happy to be able to help and support wherever we possibly can. And uh, there'll be some very useful resources and links through there so that you can uh, make sure you are looking up yourself and reminding yourself that your health is the priority. My name is Leila Mackenzie Dallas, and you've been listening to the Dahl Global Virtual Lounge. We're actually now with you every week, and the podcast show also is with you twice a week now during COVID 19. So thank you very much, and you can visit us at www.dahlglobal.org. And thank you very much again, guys. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Have you.